Well, I want to jump into the series, and this is just a short two-week series that I, that I want to share with you guys, and it's Join the Conversation, and we're going into Easter, and I wanted us to really think about a couple of things. I brought a table on stage this morning because this table is a picture of the church, and I want to walk through this this morning and really talk to you about that. Have you guys ever heard of a little place called Canton, Texas? Just a little small place, Canton, Texas. Well, it's very, very famous. And if you heard someone clapping, I guarantee it was a woman because it's world famous and it's the largest flea market in our country. And so it's right outside of Dallas, maybe an hour or so. And we were in Dallas a while back, a couple of years ago. And, and Kay wanted to go to Canton. She wanted to go to this, this flea market, and she had to drag me out there. I did not want to go. And the population of, of all the people that go to this flea market is 90% women, and there's nothing in Canton except the flea market. And so all these women are flocking there, and they have one thought, one thing, and that is shopping. And so the, the young ladies are at a fast pace, walking as fast as they can from one big barn to another big barn, from one tent to another tent. And these young women, they are speed walking, and they're outdoing the older women. And so you know what the women do at Canton, the older women? They rent these little motorized scooters, and now they're outdoing the younger women. And so, I mean, you just don't get in their path, in their way, they'll run you down. Well, Kay was so excited about getting there, and, and they have everything that you can think of. I mean, they have handcrafted furniture that, that is at a fraction of the price that you would pay in a furniture store. They have clothing and jewelry and tools, and I mean, I mean anything that you want to, that you would like, it, it's there. Well, Kay was shopping, and I passed by the, the food market, and it's just this big barn, open air all the way around, and, and all these little vendors, and I said, Kay, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. And so I hung out at this uh, at this food court, and it really was amazing. I mean, it was all kinds of, of specialized foods. And, you know, every year I love going to the fair, and I love fair food. And, and this is fair food on steroids at Canton. Uh, they, they've got the most outrageous food, and they've got the huge turkey legs and the barbecue, and then, then they fry everything, deep fry. They will deep fry a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. They'll deep fry your hot dog. They'll deep fry a turkey sandwich. Well, I couldn't make up my mind, and so I just started buying everything, and, and I had three plates of food sitting there at this picnic table, case shopping, I'm eating, and I'm having a great time. And so I, I eat all of this, and it's heavy, heavy fried food, and, and I am stuffed. Well, what I notice is that there's such competition at Canton, all these food vendors, and so they've hired these young girls to take a tray, a sample of their food, and they walk around and they're offering you a sample. Well, she walks over to the picnic table that I'm sitting at. I've just finished three plates of food, and she's handing me a sample, and I'm saying, no thanks. I, 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 I really can't. If I take one more bite, I'm going to explode. I cannot do it. And, and I watched her as she went around from picnic table to picnic table, and she was offering samples, and some people were taking them, other people were denying it because they were just already stuffed. And as I watched that unfold, I thought, how ironic that here this young girl is walking around with a tray of samples, and she's walking around and she's offering it to those who are already full, those who have already been fed, when all she would have to do is just step out a few feet outside this building, outside from the shade, and step out in the heat, out in the outside elements where literally thousands of people are streaming up and down the sidewalks right outside that building and stand there and offer samples to the people who have not yet come in. And, and maybe these people are, are on a mission and they're shopping, they don't have time to eat, and yet they will stop just long enough to grab a sample and take a bite, and then it stops them dead in their tracks, and they turn around to their friends, and they say, hey, we've got to eat sometime today, that is incredible, let's go in and get something to eat, and it would entice them to come from the outside to come into the inside, and as I sat at the picnic table, I thought, that is an amazing picture of the church. Because what we do is we continue week after week after week feeding the already fed. 
those that have already crammed the Word of God inside of them, those who have been educated beyond their level of obedience, that they have more knowledge and more information than they'll ever be able to follow when just a few feet outside of this building. There are those that have never been fed. They have never received. We can step out from the shade and the, and the, comfort, uh, and the, the comfort of this building and step outside and that we can step into the elements, into the real world, and that we can begin to entice and encourage and invite people to come and receive the Word of God. You know, it's in John chapter 6 and verse 35 that Jesus made this very amazing statement when he said, I am the bread of life. Now, it's, it's really incredible when you think about what he's saying here. I am. I am the bread of life that whoever comes and takes this bread, that you will not hunger or thirst ever again because it will so satisfy you that it will meet a need that, will, that nothing else in this world will meet. And you think about this bread of life that he's offering, it's from the spiritual side. Now, physical food is, is very, very important. And isn't it amazing how often we think about food? I mean, we're always thinking about food. This morning when I got up out of bed, I'm thinking, what am I going to eat for breakfast? And I couldn't wait to get to Copper Point Cafe and, and stop by the point out there and, and get a burrito and a coffee. I mean, I'm already thinking about food. Well, not long from now, I'm going to be thinking about lunch. Then later on, I'm going to be thinking about dinner. We're always thinking about food. And throughout the week, between meals, we're thinking about a snack. We're thinking about food all the time. Well, food is the fuel, and it fuels our body. And it's what keeps us moving and what keeps us going and it strengthens our body. But think about this. What if you decided that, you know, I'm just going to eat one meal a week. On the weekend, I'm just going to come and, and I'm just going to eat one meal. That after a few weeks, you're losing a tremendous amount of weight and it's not in a healthy way. Because after a few weeks and you're going into a month and maybe two months, your body is alerted. And it kicks into starvation mode. And what it does is it starts eating the excess fat to survive. And when the fat is gone, then it starts feeding on the muscle. And you begin to wither and draw up. And you lose your strength because you're eating one meal a week. And you're becoming frail and weak and sickly because you're not fueling your physical body in the right way. What Jesus was saying is that you must feed your spirit person in the same way as you feed your physical body. And the amount of people that, that will come in on a weekend and they will eat one meal, receive the Word of God one time in that week, and then throughout the rest of the week, they never go back to the Word of God. They never read, they never internalize the Word of God, and therefore one one meal a week spiritually, we begin to wither and dry up, and we're asking the questions. I mean, church-going people, what's wrong with me? And, and why am I struggling? And why is life such a drag? And why is my marriage falling apart? And my kids are rebelling? And things aren't going well in my life? Where is God? And the whole thing is, you cannot separate the Word of God from God Himself. They're the same. And what we have is that when we're internalizing the Word of God into our life, that we're building and we're strengthening ourselves. And if we're not doing that, then we're going to wither and we're not going to walk under the blessings and the favor that God has for us. Because the favor of God is based upon the Word of God moving into our lives, building our lifestyle on the principles of God, and it causes us to walk in the blessing and the favor of who God is. In Romans 12, 2, it talks about that, that and it warns us, don't, don't allow yourself to be conformed into the image of the world. In other words, don't allow yourself to fall into the pattern that everybody else is, is walking. Don't do that. But he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that on a daily basis, that you're feeding yourself on the Word of God. Guys, we have never been at a time that the Word of God is so easy for us to obtain it and receive it. I mean, there are 
apps and there are websites that you can go to, you can download, they'll e email you every single day. There are Bible studies for men, Bible studies for women. I mean, fabulous information. And every day you receive it as an email. And every day you read a portion of God's Word. And even though you start off maybe small, that the Word of God is entering in and every day it's building and you are building muscle, you are building strength, you are building what, what God wants you to build. It's, it's walking under the blessing and the power of God. You know, we have this ultimate challenge in our life. It is to turn what we're doing here this morning into the ultimate dining experience. And it's where when we walk into this place that we recognize that it's like this table and that we're going to come and sit and receive the Word of God, something that, 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 that stimulates us on the inside and moves us forward and, and strengthens us and betters our life. That's the purpose of the Word of God. You know, it's, it's like sitting at a table and having a, an incredible dining experience. You know, there are, are several times that, that I have had a dining experience that was so out of the ordinary, so incredible that I still remember them today. One was when Kay and I were very young, and we had not been married very long. We were in Dallas, and a couple, we were visiting a church, and a couple met us there, took us to dinner, and they took us to a hotel where it was this, this buffet that I had never seen anything like this. The food was, was, was incredible. I mean, the way they prepared it and the display of food, and it was room after room after room of, of food. And Kay and I could have never, ever afforded anything like that. And yet they took us there and bought that meal. I still remember it today because it made such an impression on me. It was just such an amazing dining experience. You know... Whenever you want to bless someone, when someone's special, another couple, a friend, and, and, you, and you want to invite them over for dinner, and you really want this to be one of those spectacular moments, one that they'll never forget. Well, first of all, you call them up, and, and you invite them, you pick a date, a, a, a date and a time, and, and then you choose what that will be. And then when they agree to that, then you start opening up the cookbooks and the recipes, and you start, you know, thumbing through all of those. And what am I going to prepare? Is it going to be beef or chicken or fish? I mean, what am I going to cook? But whatever it is, you want it to be over the top. And so you're planning and planning, and then you go to the grocery store, and you have your list, and you buy all the ingredients, and then the day comes... And on that day that your guests are coming to your house, you're frantically cleaning and mopping, and you want everything spit-shined, everything looking in its place and perfect, and you're preparing the food, you're baking the desserts, and you're cleaning the house, and you're getting everything ready. And then later that evening, you pull out the tablecloth and put it on the table, and you pull out the candles, and your guests arrive. They walk in the de door and everything is sparkling and clean and nice and, and there's that beautiful aroma of the candles that you have lit, the, 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 the nicest china that you have, the silverware, the napkins, everything is to perfection. The meal is brought out and it's cooked just perfect and, and, and you're so pleased with how everything turned out and you enjoy that evening together. And it will be a night that they will not forget because you went so out of your way to make it so special. That is exactly the picture of the church, of what we're doing here this morning, because this is a dining experience, not for the already fed. It's great for us to come together. There's a purpose of us coming together, but the purpose is understanding that together we reach out and we reach our family members and our friends and our workmates and our classmates that are far away from God. What we do not want to, yeah, what we do not want to do is, is we're not just trying to, to bring people in here to, to fill them full of religion. But what we want to do is, is that we want them to come and understand that there is a God who can change everything in their life for the good. And it really is amazing. So, so think about this. Whenever you bring a guest to church, you view church, this service, so differently that when you're sitting here by yourself. Because when you bring a guest, you are concerned not about yourself, but you're concerned about them. What are they sensing? What are they feeling? What are they receiving? Do they like it? Do they not like it? And you bring a guest because you love your church and you want them to experience what you've experienced. 
So you invite a guest, and you walk in the front doors with them, and, and you're so desperately wanting everything to be in its proper place and everything to be spit-shined, everything clean. You don't want a pile of junk over here and trash on the floor over here, but you want someone who have already come in, and they've done everything, and it looks so beautiful and nice. As you walk in the doors, you want the greeters today to be on their game, and you want them to be so friendly and reach out and, and shake hands and smile and make your guest feel welcome. When you stop by the, the coffee shop, you want it to be the, the best coffee they've had all week long. And then you enter into the auditorium and the worship starts and you want that worship experience to be at the highest level of the sound, to be at the, at the very, very best. And you want these people to have practiced all week long that they might present and to draw us into the presence of God. And you desire that. And then I walk out on the stage and you're rooting me on saying, all right, pastor, don't blow it today. Come on. I mean, don't do what you did last week. Come on. You got to nail, nail this thing because because you're concerned about your friend and you want it to be the best that it can be. And it's, it's when you sit with a friend is when you're highly sensitive to all of the surroundings. And it's why that we need to constantly be bringing friends because we work together. And for us to pull this event together, just like what we're doing this morning, it has taken hundreds and hundreds of people to pull this off. Because what we say week after week is this service is designed for your unsaved friends, family members that we want you to bring because we love those people and we want them to be part of our church. Now, you know, there is such a misconception of what the church is today here in America. Somehow we've got this thing really messed up. But this is the healthy church. If you want to know what Jesus established, and then you read in the New Testament what the Apostle Paul, how he created as he planted churches, you'll find that this is the makeup that the healthiest churches in America or around the world are made up in thirds. The congregation is made up of one-third of mature Christian people. Now, you know who they are. They're the, they're the solid, faithful people here every single week. They are committed. They're generous. They're givers. They're tithers. They're servers. Really, they're the ones that make the church go around. It's one-third of this congregation. They are the mature people. And then another third of the congregation sit in this seat. And these people, they are the baby Christians. The people that we've invited in, people that were far away from God, who have never really had church in their culture. And now they're coming. They've received Christ. And wow, something so struck them on the spiritual side that they're growing and they're, and they're internalizing the Word of God. They're baby Christians. They're hungry. They're excited. One-third of our congregation needs to be made up of baby Christians. Then you come over and then one-third of our congregation needs to be what we'd call, we would call the hell-bounders, the hell-raisers. And you know exactly who they are. They're the skirt-chasing, cocaine-snorting, I mean, beer-guzzling, foul-mouth-talking people. And absolutely we want them here, and we want to befriend them, and we want to embrace them. And that's the, that's the makeup of the church, and, and the, the name of the game is diversity. I mean, it's where we become so diverse that we're so different. And when people say, I'm not going to church anymore, I mean, it's just a bunch of hypocrites. Well, you need to agree with them and say, you better believe it. Our church is filled with them. I mean, it's filled with every kind of person you can imagine. That's the, what the church is. You know, when you think about uh, the, the diversity of the church, that, that really the church should be made up of, of an atheist, a Christian, a Republican, a Democrat, the arrogant, the insecure, the rich, the poor, the single, the married, the divorced, the straight, the gay, the sick, the healthy. I mean, it's every kind of walk of life that you can imagine. That's what's supposed to be in the church. Do you realize that when you read the story of Jesus Christ, do you know why he was murdered by the religious people? It was over this very issue, diversity. They despised him and they hated him because he spent more time with those that were opposite of himself than those who were religious, and they wanted Jesus to be with them when he wanted to be with those that were so far differently from himself. And you know, you look at this picture of the church, and it really is incredible because this, that, the, the diversity that, that causes the strength 
of really spreading the gospel around the world. Whenever you think about the differences of people, then whenever you think about someone who has a mohawk, a shaved head, long hair, tattoos all over their body, a goatee, a beard, all of those things are represented on our stage in our worship team because they're all part of who we are as a culture and as a people and, and that we're not the same and we don't want to always look the same. You see, the, the mature person is constantly looking and is highly aware of his surroundings every single day, and he realizes that the job that I work at, where I live out my life every day, is my ministry, my world, my evangelistic world that I've been called to, and the mature will invite the hellbounders, and they will first befriend them and love them and care about them and, and will invest in them and will invite them to sit with them. And there are many of these people that will sit and hear the Word of God and the Holy Spirit will strike them and they will receive Christ and they will become a new believer, and a new believer will continue to grow until they become a mature Christian, and a mature Christian is out just loving and serving and befriending the hellbounders, and it becomes this amazing mechanism that God has put in, in, in charge and in force. And yet, and yet, there are so many negatives that have taken place in the church. You know, People outside don't trust us. It's where we don't just care about ourselves and our little routines, but when we're in the world, six days a week, that we really care about those whose marriages are falling apart. We really care about young adults that have no direction in life. We really care about those who are bound on alcohol and drugs. We really care about those who are contemplating suicide because life is so bad. We really care about those people. And the reason why is because we care about diversity and we care about all people and not just people like ourselves. Now, I want you to take a look at this video. I love this video. Take a look at this. The old saying goes, don't judge a book by its cover. And it's true. Don't look at that person who ends up next to you and say, that person is way too different from me. I could not invite him to my church. I can't have my friends see me bringing this guy in. We need to see others as Christ sees them, with a holy compassion for the lost. You know what? We all need God, no matter what the person looks like, or how different they are from you. As Christians, we are responsible to reach out to those around us. Their eternity depends on it. We need to stop worrying about the opinions of others. We need to open our eyes. New opportunities are put in front of us every single day to come out of our comfort zone, open our mouths, and speak these simple words. Hey man, if you're not doing anything this weekend, uh, check this out, we're doing something cool at our church. So. Well, I love that. That is absolutely amazing. Copper Point Church, that's exactly who we are. And it's not about this cookie-cutter mentality, a stereotypical church-going person that you have to look a certain way, you don't have to look a certain way. We could care less how you look. What we care about is introducing you to the Creator that can change your life and your direction. That's what we care about. You know, Kay and I, when we first moved to Albuquerque, and it's been so many years, we were just kids. I mean, we were uh, just, just newly married, and, and we had been here one week, and the talk of the town was this one restaurant. And let me know if you remember this restaurant, Bella Vista. Do you remember that? <laughs> Only the older ones remember that. Bella Vista, wow, what an amazing place that was. It was over on the other side of the mountain, and it was uh, uh, up in the pine trees, and this beautiful setting, and this thing that, that was been built on, built on, built on. I mean, it sprawled across the hillside, but it was the talk of the town, and so Kay and I said, well, let, let's go try it. So just the two of us, we jumped in the car and drove around on the other side, and, and it was a grand experience. Uh, it was all of the fried chicken and all of the fried fish that you could eat, and Friday
Friday nights, that place, Friday and Saturday, it was jam-packed with people. It was like the whole city went over, and people lined out the door, and any time that we had family or friends visiting us from out of town, we went to Bella Vista. It was a great experience, and there was just something about it. It was kind of rustic, and, and, and it was friendly. It was inviting. The people were so kind, and it was just one of those great, great restaurants that I never got tired of. Well, as popular as it was, uh, something happened over a process of years that I don't know if they changed management or they sold to someone else, but as we continued going, that I started making comments to Kay like, wow, you know, this place is starting to look run down. It wasn't kept like it used to be kept, and, and the floors looked greasy and, and looked dirty, and, the, and the, the waiters and waitresses, they weren't trained, and they weren't kind, and they act like they didn't even want to be there, and they made you feel like you didn't want to be there, and, and the food quality started going down. I remember the last time that I ate at Bella Vista, walked out the door, the food was, was really bad that night. And I said, Kay, you know what? I just don't want to come back here again. And, and it wasn't long after that that they closed their doors, went out of business. And it was sad for the entire city because it was such an icon of the city at that point. It lost its appeal. Somehow, the Church of America has lost its appeal. It was back in the 1950s, church and pastors, ministers, were held in high regard across these states. Today, you, you talk about Christianity, and you, you see this on mainline uh, uh, television networks, is that, well, there's a real negative feel and slant towards Christianity. And somehow, we, the church people, have created the world to feel that way about us, that we have lost our appeal to the people around us. There was a survey that was done that really is, is incredible when you think about this. It's a survey done of people that are non-believers. If you ask someone, are you a Christian? Nope. This is the survey that they took. People that do not go to church, do not claim to be a Christian. And so they gathered this and, and, they, and they took these people and they asked them three, three things. We're going to give you three words and we want you to just give us four or five words that, that come to mind when you hear this word. Ready? Jesus. Now, this unchurched crowd, when they heard the word Jesus, these are the most popular responses. Accepting, compassionate, gracious, forgiving, and wise. Whoa, that, that is shocking to me. That's the unchurched crowd. The second word that was thrown out was Christian. These are the most popular words that came back. Critical, exclusive, self-righteous, narrow-minded, and unforgiving. And then another word that was thrown out, church. What, what comes to mind when you hear the word church? And the most popular words were out of touch, irrelevant, legalistic, unaccepting, and unfriendly. And why? Why? Because we stopped doing what Jesus did. And it was back in the 1970s that the Church of America turned inward, and everything was about me. Everything was about making me feel good. Everything's about my family. Everything's about how I want things done. And it became like a country club instead of focusing on the outward and knowing that this thing is about labor and it's about sacrifice and loving people and drawing people and impacting people and changing their lives. And when the church turned inward, the world turned their back on the church. You know, Jesus, and let me wrap this up by saying that Jesus demonstrated three things that Christians do. And let me just very quickly cover these three things. Number one, a Christian bef befriends the lepers. Let me read this story to you in Mark chapter 1, starting with verse 40. And it says, And a man with leprosy came to him, came to Jesus, and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus was indignant. And he reached out his hand and he touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. In this story, who's the unclean? Well, they're the ones that maybe we're not so comfortable with. 
the unclean, maybe they're the ones that, that are full of ungodly actions, and we have nothing in common with those people that we really want to avoid those people, and it's the people outside that are so different from ourselves, and deep inside, maybe we'd never verbalize it, but we're disgusted by those people and their actions. That's who Jesus reached out and touched, the leper that no one else would touch, Jesus was willing to touch. And there are people that we rub shoulders with every day that are being rejected by others. And yet Jesus said, those are the people that we need to be reaching out and touching, doing what Jesus did. In verse 41 of this passage, Jesus was indignant. Now that's a, that's a strong word. He was indignant. When I looked that word up in the Greek, it means compassionate. It means that he became angry to the point, angry that Satan had caused such difficulty in this person's life that he was indignant and it drove him, and the Greek word is to a deep groaning and a hurting that drove him to action, and it was this deep compassion that he wanted to help that which was hurting. And as Christians, all we're called to do is imitate Christ, imitate his actions. The second thing that Christians do, Christians befriend the prostitute. You know, Jesus sought out the sinner, and, and it really is amazing whenever you think about all the stories that he was drawn to the down and outers. He was drawn to people that no one else wanted to be around. If you'll remember the woman at, at the well, she was a Samaritan. There was not a Jew alive at that time that would have done what Jesus did. Jews hated Samaritans, and even more so, they would not talk to a woman, and he took time to be kind to her, to love her, to minister to her, and to change her life. If you'll remember, Jesus is the one that went to Matthew's house, and Matthew was a tax collector, and everyone in the city hated him, despised him, and yet Jesus said, I want to go to dinner with you. I want to go to your dinner party. It was Zacchaeus that, that was hated by the community, and yet Jesus pulls him out of the crowd and says, I want to go to your house for dinner. It was the, the crude and the cursing fisherman down at the Sea of Galilee that Jesus hung out with. It was the prostitute that was thrown at his feet that no one wanted anything to do with, and yet he took time to pour into her and to change her life. And listen to this in Luke chapter 15 and verse 2. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They went out and they began to talk to Jesus' disciples, asking these questions. Why does your master eat with sinners? Why does your master befriend the sinners? And Jesus overheard what they were saying. In Mark chapter 2 and 17, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And I have come to call the righteous, not the sinners. If you've been a born-again believer a solid, mature Christian for over five years. When was the last time that you had a hellbounder in your home for dinner? Not associated with work, but just purely on the basis of love and investment. That you bring them into your house and you invest in them and you love them because they've got to trust you and know your heart that you care about them before they will ever hear you talk about your God. And it's one of the things that we need to highly be aware of. The last and third thing, a Christian will offend the religious. Guys, if you move away from religion, from dead, dead religion, and you start following the process of Jesus Christ, the religious will throw punches at you, will criticize you, will mock you, will make fun of you. It's not the world. It'll be the religious within the boundaries of the church. And that's exactly what happened to Christ in Luke chapter 13. On the Sabbath, and I want you to listen to this story, and then I'll end. On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands upon her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant. Now, here's that word again, indignant, in a whole other story. Indignant. This time, it's speaking of the Pharisees, and when you look this word up in the Greek, it's the opposite 
of what it spoke of in Christ's life. Where in Christ it was compassion, and here it's being calloused. It is so hard-hearted because Jesus healed on the Sabbath, And the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on one of those days, but don't come in here on the Sabbath and think you're going to be healed. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Now, I love this. I mean, you're talking about we're sitting here in church. Jesus is the guest speaker. And they have all of these these high priests and all of these, these godly men sitting on the front, and he's the guest speaker going, you guys are hypocrites. And then he goes on and he says, Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out and give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? And one of the passages says, and the Pharisees were humiliated because they knew that he was right. Now, let me tell you what's so ironic about this. They were so caught up in their religious acts that you can't work on the Sabbath. And this woman is healed, and they criticize Jesus for it. And they walk out the door on the Sabbath, and they plot his murder on the Sabbath. You see, that's what dead religion will do. It's a deception. And that's what we're not about is religion. Formalities. What we've always done. This gathering and this dining experience is about one thing. And that's about inviting our family members and our friends to come and be introduced to Jesus Christ who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of gods that can change their life. And that's what it's all about. Guys, Easter is really an amazing time because whatever reason, that it's the one Sunday, the one weekend of the year that people will go to church. You can invite them, they'll come, but you can invite them every other week throughout the year and they'll turn you down and they won't come. Guys, this is our greatest moment and, and I, want to, I want to make sure that we understand the vision and where I'm coming from. This is not about reaching a certain amount of numbers of people and applauding that we had that many people. It's not about that. It's about filling every seat in every service with people that are hurting, people that are lost, people that don't know where to turn. It's people whose lives are falling apart. And they so desperately need God in their life. They so desperately need this Savior who can change every aspect of their life. And we should be so indignant today. I mean, so driven with compassion when we look and see the homeless and we see the the hurting and we see the the rejected. We see the lives that are falling apart. And we're, we're so moved that we actually ache on the inside because we really care about people, because we care about what Jesus cares about. As you came in this morning, you were handed some cards, and these are invitation cards to Easter. And I believe that Easter could be the turnaround for thousands of people in our community. I believe that with all of my heart. And it's not going to happen unless you burn on the inside. Unless I become indignant this week and next week and everywhere that I go that I carry as many cards with me as I can and I invite and I talk to and I'm kind and I'm loving and I'm just wanting people to come and experience an amazing day. I want to invite them to be introduced to my best friend. Jesus Christ. And so I want you to take these cards, and if you hold these for a moment, I want to pray with you. And I want to ask that that God would would just allow this anointing, this this, this supernatural power of His to, to move in us and through us to fill this place four different times, exposing people to something so dynamic and life changing. And as you hold this, it represents, God, I'm going to be indignant, so deeply moved with compassion, and I'm going to invite. Father, as we 
join together, I pray that, that God, that you would help us to not settle in. God, let us not be labeled as the religious crowd. God, let us be labeled as people who burn with fire, fire on the inside. Lord, that there's a passion of love. And Lord, that all this means is that I love people. I love my city. I love what you have given to me. And God, that, that all we want to do is just introduce people to a life-saving God. And I thank you, Lord, as we work together as a family making this on Easter the greatest dining experience possible. And we love you and we thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you give our great God a big hand this morning? God bless you guys.